service today. This is a great moment. And I want to take the opportunity first to greet uh, not just the moderator, but my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Stanberry, who's an eloquent, well, I don't have to tell you about him. I think most people on this line, if not all of you, are you're familiar with him and the capability, humility, achievements that this man has had through the power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and especially for the uh, members of the congregations, you have seen his humility. And I trust that you are bearing witness to it, that all things are possible with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is a fallacy when people tell you that you have to leave God to make accomplishments in this world. It's a fallacy. It's a yes. fallacy. I am a living witness. Your pastor is a living witness. We have been Christian since we were children. I'm not sure exactly when he got baptized, how old he was, but I know he was quite young. I remember him going in that van with Pastor Henry, passing through Water Lane. And that was back in the 80s. Um, and myself becoming a Christian when I was 12, going 13, almost 13 years old. And this last month, I celebrated my 54th birthday. So I've been in the business and everything that I am is because of God. Somebody praise him now. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise his name. Oh, I'm, not joking, I'm not joking with this. This is not a, we're not playing Christianity here. We're, we're talking about the reality, the truth, the reality. And we are not the only ones. Millions of Christian men and women across this globe have lived a life, chosen Jesus Christ when we were children, and we are still with the Lord. And some of us have even advanced in the word of God. Your bishop, your pastor is a bishop now. Um, and it's just amazing to see how God is working. Man who's traveled all over the world and myself. It is possible. It is nonsense when people tell you, you you become a Christian, you have something to lose. I want to tell you, if you become a Christian, you have something to gain. Is there anybody in this house that agree with me? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You don't really have anything to lose. It's, it's just a mindset. You have something to gain. And I want to tell you, this great emancipator, this Jesus Christ, this life that he gives to you, this faith that he breathes inside of you, this courage that comes inside of you when you serve him, when you understand him, I am telling you, there's nothing like it on the planet. If you are outside of God and Christ, I am telling you that you are missing out on greatness. You're missing out on greatness. And so I, I want to be timely. I know it's uh, about 11 after 8. I tend to preach long these days, but I'm trying to be as um, uh, controlled as possible because I know I'm coming back on Wednesday night. So... I want to get into the word of God, but I want to greet the men of God and the women of God, all the missionaries, all the evangelists, uh, the workers, and uh, those who uh, not don't have a title, but you are truly um, invested in the word of God and the kingdom. I want to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thank you uh, for your blessings. Um, I want to thank Pastor Stanberry for the invitation as well. I think this is pretty awesome that I get the opportunity, you know, to open up tonight. And uh, I don't know how many people on the line are not believers, but I really want to, it's a crusade. So the idea is that we are trying to bring the word of God to someone who's not yet saved. And so if you are watching, if you're participating and you're not a believer, you can, I, I, could you just put it in the chat? You don't have to state who you are. Just put it in the chat. Just say, I'm not a believer. I'm, I'm visiting. I want to hear what you have to say, Pastor. I want to see if you can convince me that G, it's worth serving Jesus Christ. You can write it in the chat. It's the same way as lifting your hands in, a, in the sanctuary. Or you can raise your hand with the hand button, whichever way. So I want to talk today about, I want to use for a topic the great exchange. I want to use for a topic under the theme, Jesus, great emancipator, which is your theme for the entire week. 
I want to use uh, the topic, the great exchange. I think it is necessary that you understand what transpired. I think even as believers, it is necessary to understand what transpired. And there are three things that I want to walk you through today that I think would be valuable for you to understand. Firstly, I want you to understand what was this great exchange? What was this great exchange? The second thing I want you to understand, why was the great exchange necessary? Why was it necessary? And perhaps this is where I will put most of my emphasis tonight. Why was this exchange necessary? And thirdly and lastly, I would like to speak to you about how did this great exchange take place? So I want to talk about those three things. What is the great exchange or was the great exchange? What was the, uh, why was the great exchange necessary? I'm answering these three questions for you tonight. And how did this great exchange take place? The first thing we have to understand if you are, whether you're a Christian or not, I think most Christians will understand this already, but I want to speak to those who are not yet given their lives to Christ, is that the world was framed by God. It is a concept that is, cannot be explained because the issue we always run into, whether you're an atheist or a Christian, the problem you run into is it doesn't matter you go back to a place where you cannot explain the first cause. So whether you believe in God or you believe in evolution, you cannot explain the first cause. You cannot explain where God came from. Nobody can explain where God goes. Who can explain where God comes from? How can there be a being that has no beginning? God has no beginning. The human mind cannot comprehend the concept. It, the concept is too, it's too, it's too, it's beyond our comprehension that there is a being that always existed. Take a moment and, and think about that for a minute. Maybe you haven't thought about that. God has always existed. God has always been. You cannot pinpoint where God came from. Nobody can tell how God came into being and what existed before God because God has always existed. And beyond God's existence, God made everything that exists. So before all things which we see, whether trees or planets or, or stars or solar systems or whatever they are, galaxies, before any of that existed, there was God. God is the one who made all of it. Oh, come on, Christian. You ought to praise God here. Light up that chat. I light up the chat. I like to, I like to, I like to hear your interaction or feel you interacting. So light up that chat. If there's somebody that is not a believer tonight, they need to understand that we have enthusiasm for the gospel. We understand why we are here. We understand why we are preaching. We understand why we are, we are talking about this, this God, this great emancipator, Jesus Christ. Now there are a few things I want to make clear to you tonight before I end the service. And my my complete goal is to reveal to you the value that God's placed on you. Can I say that again? At the end of the sermon, every person, whether you're a believer or you're unbeliever, you're supposed to understand the great value that God placed on you. So when we speak about the great exchange, we're talking about one thing for another thing. And typically, if you exchange one thing for another thing, the person who got the better deal, amen. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Somebody got a better deal out of this. Somebody got a deal out of this. It was a bargain. You couldn't pay for it. So I want to go back for a minute. So God existed. God existed. Nothing else but God existed. And God decided to make a being. Consider this for a minute. Consider this. God decided to make a being called man. If you believe the account of creation, then God at some point, if I can use the terminology, decided that he was going to make this being. And the being was going to look the way we are today. Now, the, 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 the story of the creation is etched in the book of Genesis. And so... I, the first thing I wanted to, before I even go to there, it's etched in the book of Genesis about how God created man. 
But before I go there, I would like to ask you to turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. This is going to be the center of my text. So that's 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. If you could turn there in your Bibles, your tablets, your phones, that'd be great. And I'd like to read just the verse 18, 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. Let me read that again. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Christ suffered for sins. And he, Christ, was sinless. I'm beginning to paint a picture here. Stay with me. Christ suffered for sin. The Bible now says that it was the just for the unjust. I want to paint you a picture of this great exchange. That he might bring us, and pay attention to their key words here, uh, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. Christ suffered for sins. Not his own. It was the just Christ that suffered for the unjust man. So center yourself in that text as we go through the sermon. The second part of this is that we want to understand. So God created this man. The story is in the book of Genesis. God created this man and he placed him in the garden. The, the idea behind it, firstly... And every Christian should be happy about this. Is that God had a reason for making man. When we read. Well essentially that question. That a lot of people ask. Well God just made man to praise him. I want to tell you. It is not necessarily as accurate as most people. We draw it from Revelation chapter 4. God didn't just make man to praise him. God made man to have dominion. Man was sharing the qualities of God. In other words, man, human man, is, is, is a God-man in his own domain on earth. Are you following me? So God ruled in heaven. All the angels are in heaven. The cherubs are in heaven, or the cherubim. The, the archangels are in heaven. The beast and the elders are in heaven. But God decided that he was going to make another being, and that being was going to have his own dominion. Say dominion. Light up the chat. I want to see you interacting. God said he was going to make this being and this being was going to have his own dominion. You are fearfully, David says, and you are wonderfully made. You were, you were made out of purpose. You weren't not an accident. It's not God didn't just get up one day and just go, yeah, I think I'll just do something. There was intention behind you. Woo, Holy Ghost. Man, when I think about the fact that God made me and that God had purpose for me and that God had purpose for you and that God made you to have the same character and characteristics as he does, that you can rule and reign and have dominion in the earth. Come on now. Somebody ought to praise God with me. I, I'm excited about this. I'm ex when I hear these kind of stuff, Although I'm speaking it, I get it just completely excited. If you are outside of God and Christ, let me tell you, you don't understand how valuable you are. I want to prove to you tonight that you are the most valuable thing that God ever created. Not only did God make man, but I want to pause that for a second. Go back to the creation and I'm summarizing because I want to go fast and I want to get into the, the three points that I want to make. The first thing we need to understand is that God valued man so much that in the book of Genesis, God created the ideal conditions for, for, for him to exist in. In other words, God didn't just make you and just throw you on the earth. God, in the beginning, he created, the scripture says, the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep now God's intention came in God says I'm going to do something because I'm going to make something Woo! God says I'm going to do something because I'm going to make something you were there's purpose in your life say purpose light it up in the chat 
There is purpose in your life. You're not an accident. You're not some random, uh, Charles Darwin says, you're not just some random act that came about out of uh, an explosion of gases. You were intentionally made. Woo, say, oh, say intention, say intention. Light up that chat, say intention. I was intentionally made. God made Adam and Eve. And before he did that, he created the conditions necessary for them, amen, to rule and reign. It was interesting to me, I'm setting the foundation that God said to, to Adam, everything, by the way, and I think most people may know this already, everything that was named was named by Adam. God was showing Adam that you have purpose, you have intention, and you have dominion. Man, that's good. You have purpose, you have intention, you have dominion. Come on, Christian. <laughs> The next time when you go to work tomorrow, you got to know that you have purpose, uh, you have intention, uh, and you have dominion. When you go to school tomorrow, you got to lift up your head and walk with it high. And somebody says, why is that person walking on cloud nine? Because you have purpose, uh, you have intention, uh, and God has given you dominion. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. So watch this. So God created the ideal conditions. And then he made the man and he put him in the garden. And then he said to the man, have dominion over everything. It's yours. It's yours. Now, God was going to do something amazing. God said, the tree of life in the, is in the middle of the garden. I'm setting this up. The tree of life is in the middle of the garden. And, and I don't, and, I, and, and, there, and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Those things are intentional. Some people in theology, they ask, well, why would God make the tree of knowledge and of, of knowledge of good and evil? And why would God just put it in the garden? Well, you see, God intention was behind that too. When God made the tree of life, which we, we see in Revelation again, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was when Adam matured. And this has always been my theology. When Adam matured, he can eat of anything in the garden. But now you see he was an infant. And you cannot give an infant a loaded gun. Are you following? You cannot give an infant a loaded gun. So God says, don't eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. I want to reserve that till you are mature. Because although he was made a man and Eve was made a woman, they were innocent and they were immature. But over time, God had intention and purpose and was going to give him dominion. And when he matured, God was going to give him everything. Are you following? So God made the man. He's in the garden. He's ruling and he's, and, he, and he's reigning. And God said to him, listen, don't eat of that tree. Eat of anything you want. Just don't eat of that one. That's, that's, that's for later. That's not for now. Now, the Bible said now in chapter 3 of Genesis, and you can follow along, that, that the, the, the serpent or the Satan was more subtle than any other beast in the field. And he came to Eve and he said to Eve, Eve was away from Adam. Uh, Adam was not there at the time. And he said to the woman, as God told you not to eat of the tree, and, and, and I just want to just read it through. And the woman says, yeah, God says, if we eat of it or touch it, we will die. And the enemy, this is basic theology, the enemy says to, to her, no, it's not going to happen that way. If you eat of it, you will not die. God knows that what's contained in the tree of Nekoshatarraba, what's contained in the tree of the knowledge of good and is the knowledge of good and evil. What's contained is the knowledge of good and evil. God has the knowledge of good and evil. So going back to my earlier point, the only reason why they couldn't eat of the tree because they were children. Although they were grown in body, they were children. And as I said before, you don't give a child a loaded gun. But when Adam is mature, like you are mature, you can talk to me about good and evil. It doesn't matter because I'm mature. Are you following me? Write it up in the chat if you understand it. Or say, Pastor, explain that some more. So, so we are in the Garden of Eden. And, and this is necessary because, because we have to understand why the, the great exchange is necessary. We have to understand why we need an emancipator. If you don't understand why you need an emancipator, then, then that's why you don't become Christians. Because then what's the point? So follow along the story. 
the just for the unjust. Christ suffered for our sins. So God said to Adam, do not eat of the tree. And the woman, when she saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and something to make a person wise, she took of the fruit and she ate thereof, and she gave it also to her husband. And then God came down in the garden and saw them, and they were, they were hiding from him. And God said, why are you hiding? Now, it's interesting because when God is using the expression, why are you hiding? God is not asking because he doesn't know where they are. God is asking because God already knew what they did. So Adam said, we heard your voice in the garden and we were afraid. And, 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 and so we hid ourselves because we were naked. And God had a conversation with them. Not because for God, God is having a conversation with them because God already knew what happened. Now, the, 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 the third thing that happened was God banished them from the Garden of Eden. Why is this necessary? Why did God banish the man and the woman from the Garden of Eden? Because contained in the Garden of Eden is the tree of life. Now, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now you have the knowledge of good and evil, and you have now fallen from the grace of God, if you eat of the tree of life, what ends up happening is that you fall from the grace of God forever. Because now you have eaten and you cannot die anymore because you have eaten of the tree of life. So God moved them away from the tree of life. And the Bible said God placed an angel to guard it and, and they, they went out and started life. And we know the earth and everything began to feel the effects of man's fall. So we call this the great fall. Man fell from God. As a matter of fact, the, the great exchange explains to us that when we get to Romans chapter 5, that, that not only had man fallen from God, God, man had become an enemy of God. Man had become an enemy of God by virtue of the fact that he disobeyed God. And now the spirit that worked in Lucifer is now working in him. He's struggling. Hey, you feel it every day, right? You feel it every day. I feel it every day. We love God. Even on, this, even on this chat right now, people who love God are struggling. We find ourselves doing evil. Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, what is this? This is madness. How can I want to do good and end up doing evil? How can I want to, to shun evil? And, 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 and what wretchedness is this? Paul recognize that we have no capability over ourselves anymore outside of the glory and the power of the great emancipator, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So watch this. Are you still with me? Light it up in the chat. I want to know you're still there. So the word of God tells us that God drove the man from the garden and now the man is sentenced to eternal death. He is going to die. Chapter 3 of Genesis tells us, God said, you shall eat of the sweat of your brow until you die. Meaning, until you return to the earth from which I took you. And when he died, there was no redemption. He would have died and died forever. But the Bible tells me, according to John's gospel, because Jesus told John while he was on earth, for God so loved him. You see, even though God drove him from the garden, God's heart is still connected to Adam. Whom am I speaking with? Hey, you are outside of God and Christ. You think that because you're not a Christian, that you, God doesn't love you. God is still connected to you. It's the same way Adam sinned against God. God is still connected to him. The same way that, that, that you are rejected Jesus Christ, God is still connected to you. God made a deal, hallelujah, to rescue you. It was the great exchange of Jesus Christ, the, the great emancipator. So watch this. Are you following the storyline? Say, yes, pastor, we are. So man now would have lived and died in eternal sin. There was no redemption. That would have been his cycle. You would have lived and you would have died. Your children would have lived and they would have died. Your grandchildren would live and they would die and nobody would come back. There is no hope. There was no, there was no such thing called a resurrection. Man would just die and that's it, go into oblivion. 
But the Bible tells me that God so loved him. You see, even though Adam sinned against God and God was upset with him and God moved him out of the garden, but God already told him, the day you sin, you shall die. And God cannot change his word. God was in a pickle. God had a problem that only God could solve. Watch this. Oh, God, I'm about to get excited here. God had a problem that Adam couldn't solve. See, Adam could not redeem himself. This word redemption conjures up the idea that you owe for your own life. In other words, you owe for yourself. And, the own, and the, there is a price to be paid for yourself. And that price cannot be paid with money. There's no amount of money that could pay the price for you. There's no amount of riches that could pay the price to bring Adam out of his fallen state. There was nothing Adam could do to bring himself Hallelujah, out of that condition. There is nothing you can do, hallelujah, to bring yourself out of your condition. You need an emancipator. You need an emancipator. You need, oh glory to God, you need an emancipator. If you're outside of God and Christ, you need an emancipator. You have already proven in your own self that you cannot help yourself. If you could have helped yourself, you would have helped yourself a long time ago. If you could have rescued yourself, you would have rescued yourself a long time ago. You have proven in your own self that it is not possible for you to, 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 to rescue yourself. So you need an emancipator. God was in this pickle. I'm about to get to the end of the sermon. God was in this pickle. What is, what is the pickle God is in? God loves a man. Have you ever loved somebody? You're, but the person, you have to punish them. When you have to punish and love at the same time. <laughs> you have to punish and love at the same time. All the parents in this house, you can understand exactly what I'm saying. It, it pains your heart to punish. When you love your children, it pains your heart to punish. But you see, there is something about God called justice. God cannot just willy-nilly change his mind. God couldn't just go, well, you know, you sin, but... God can go, ah, let's forget about it. Let's start over. He can't do that because God is a God of justice. And you know what? You might not know this, but if God had said to Adam, listen, we're just going to forget it. Let's start over. The devil, watch this. I'm teaching. The devil could turn around to God and says, listen, you're unjust. You're unjust. I sinned against you and you cast me out of heaven. You bind the angels with chains until the day of judgment. To be cast into the lake of fire. But he sinned and you just let him go. So I want to teach you a story. You will never find this in the Bible. This is Revelation chapter 23. You'll never find it in the Bible. The only way for God to rescue Adam and keep his justice, keep his word, God had to strike a deal. What is this deal? It is an exchange. I will give up. The just. I will give up myself. For the unjust. That's the deal. The deal is to Satan. Fine. You sinned. I cast you out. He sinned. I cast him out. But I want to redeem him. Satan. You'd never find this in the Bible. Satan said. Well how are you going to redeem him? God said. Well I'll give myself. Do you know your worth? Do you know your value? Do you know how important you are to God? You that are outside of God and Christ, do you have any idea how much God loves you? Do you have any idea what it took? God, woo, I'm about to get into this. And if I can't finish tonight, I'll finish on, on Wednesday night. God, in this great exchange, made a bargain. And God said, what if I died? I'm telling you the story according to Revelation 23. What if I died? Satan said, well, well what do you mean? He said, well, what if I died? What if I took his... What if I take his place? What if I let, what if I paid the price that he owed that he cannot pay? Well, what would it take? Oh, Revelation chapter 23, it will take blood. It will take death. Somebody has to pay the price that he owes. And God said, well, I'll do it. Satan said, well, what do you mean you will do it? Yeah, I'll do it. So the great exchange was God. God himself in the person of his word made flesh 
exchanged himself for Adam. Took what Adam should have received upon himself. Man, where, where have you ever heard this before, brothers? Which, which, which God in this universe that you have heard of has ever sacrificed himself for any that serve him. Every other God wants men to serve him. Every other God wants man to sacrifice to him. But this God, this great Elohim, this great Hashem, they call him Yahweh. They call him the great I am. Some call him Jehovah. Whatever you want to call him is the only God that loved you so much that he was willing to sacrifice himself for you. My, 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 my. Oh, you ought to be grateful. You ought to be grateful. I'm coming down. I'm coming Amen. down. Now, listen. So this was the great exchange. God made a deal with the enemy. I'm going to give up myself. But God cannot die. God cannot die. So how, how, is, this, how is this possible? So we see here the great exchange. God took man's place. God took man. That's what the great exchange was. God took man's place. But God has a problem. I can't die. So how is this going to be possible? It is possible and it was necessary for God to clothe himself in humanity. God needed a body that could die. God needed a body to pay the price of death. And so God, the only great creator, is the only one who can conceive something so amazing. Watch this. I'm going to the book of John chapter the book of the gospel of John, come with me. John chapter one, let's read it. John chapter one, let's read it. Let's read how, it, how, how John sees it. John chapter one, I'm at verse one. That which was from the beginning, meaning God was Christ. The word was with God from the beginning. Which we have heard and seen with our eyes and have looked upon and our hands have handled of the what? Of the word of life. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Come on. Look at that text again. Look at that text again. Look at that text again. We, we, we have probably never seen it in this context. But look at that text again. That which was from the beginning. In other words, John is attesting to the fact that Jesus Christ is from the beginning. Which we have heard, meaning they, when they was in walking through Galilee or Capernaum or wherever, which was from, we have seen Jesus Christ, which we have looked upon Jesus Christ. Our hands touched Jesus Christ, but he was not just Jesus Christ. Before he was Jesus, he was the word of life. That which was from the beginning, when? Which beginning? That which was with God, when God said, let there be light, that was Jesus when God said, <laughs> let the waters, uh, let the found firmament come forth from the waters, that was Jesus. When God said, let there be light, when God said, let the heavens appear, that was his word. His word was God. Amen. <laughs> I'm getting ahead. Watch verse 2. For the life was manifest, the same word of life. The word of life, meaning Jesus Christ, who was the word of God in God's mouth. The life was manifest and we seen the life, the word become something and bear witness and shew unto you that he is the eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested. Now, this is a big word. This is a big word. How was he manifested? Why does John use this word that he was manifested? The manifestation is that when I am speaking to you right now, you cannot see my words. You can only hear my words. For my word to be seen, it has to take on a shape. And that term manifested means that God's word, if you think about somebody speaking, which cannot be actually seen, now God had to give it a body. God had to give his word a body. And that word God took off himself and that's why the, what, one of the great complications about Christianity because some people say Jesus is God and some say well no Jesus is separate from God and I'm telling you that Jesus that both people are right Jesus is God and yet Jesus is separate from God because it, it was God's word which is God 
And God turned that word into the womb of a woman and made it into flesh. Now watch this. Let's go back. Let's go to uh, the uh, gospel of John. We can see another aspect of this. If you are outside of God and Christ, let's go to the gospel of John. That's John 1. I want to I don't want to go too far and leave you um, too late because I know tomorrow is, is work in school. First John 1 1 in the beginning was the word. Now John is writing again the same John is writing and this time he's, he's, he's explaining it a little bit deeper. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God meaning the word just like how I'm speaking to you now my word is me. My word is me. I am my word. Everything I say is coming from me. You cannot separate me from my word. I am my word. That's why the Bible said God honors his word above his name. Because you'll see his word is him. And the word was what? The word was with God. And the word was God. In other words, the words that I am speaking, when God was speaking, that was God speaking, speaking, speaking. But when it came time for salvation, God took the same word from his mouth and turned it into, put it in the womb of a woman. And it brought forth a child. And that word now is Jesus Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. That's why we say that. Chapter verse three tells you when God was speaking, that's what it means. When God said, let there be light, it was Jesus. All things were made by him, the word, because God was speaking. Come on now, somebody light up that chat. You don't know how great you are. You don't know how awesome you are. You don't know how mighty you are. You don't know how amazing you are. So God took of himself. So the great exchange was God exchanging himself for Adam and his descendants. That was the great exchange. God exchanging himself for Adam. Why was this necessary? It was necessary because, like I said, Adam had become an enemy of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. I want to show you this because I like the word of God to speak. So go to the book of Romans chapter 5 and let's listen how Paul tells the Roman brethren exactly what this looks like. I'm reading from Romans chapter 5. I'm reading verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. Listen now, Paul puts this. This is pivotal. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we, we didn't have peace before with God. We didn't have peace with God before. We were at war with God. Every human being was at war with God. Even though you didn't, you're not, you're saying to yourself, no, but I'm not at war with God. You are at war with God the moment you are born. The moment you are born, you're at war with God. You're an enemy of God because the seed from Satan, hallelujah, which was in Adam, was passed down through generations and it's in you and I. Now watch how uh, Paul says this. Verse 6, Romans 5, 6. And when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. That, that, that's not, that doesn't happen a lot. Yet, peradventure, for a good man, some would even consider dying. For a good man, Somebody may say, well, I'll die for him. One in a, a billion, maybe. But listen, but God, say, but God, but God, but God commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, this is what I was speaking about. We were in a particular situation where we could not help ourselves and God had to rescue man. So the great exchange was God taking his word and making it into flesh. Let's look at this. Uh, this is my last text before we go close for tonight. But I want to go to the book of Luke. And I'm, and I'm putting in at Luke chapter 1 so that you understand how God did it. And I kind of explained it before, but I'd like us to just read it for the purposes of, of the benefit of reading until uh, so I can uh, conclude this. I'm reading from the book of Luke chapter one if you could turn there with me that would be awesome and thank you those who are moderating the screen seems like you got this unlocked 
at verse 26. If you could put in at verse 26. Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God on, onto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Beautiful city, by the way. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Say favor. Man, that's good. And behold, thou shalt conceive in, the, in thy womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered her and said unto her, the Holy Ghost, <laughs> the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. God is going to take his word. And the Holy Spirit is the power of God. It is God's hands and feet in the natural world. The Holy Ghost is what does God's work. So when we go back to creation, you will hear the scripture says, as I just quoted earlier, that in the beginning, that God, the, the spirit of the Lord moved over the face of the deep. That's how God moves. He moves. That's his work. God works. God is in heaven, but his spirit works on the earth. God works in the natural world by his spirit. So God is going to do the great exchange. God, the Holy Spirit, took God's word out of his mouth. And I'm using practical illustration so that you can actually make sense of it. The Holy Spirit took God's words and went down into the woman's womb and planted the word it was like a sperm to an egg. And the woman became pregnant through the Holy Spirit and the word of God fertilized her. And she brought forth a man child made of flesh and blood, but God was in him. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God, somebody light up the chat. But God was in him. God was in Jesus Christ. Uh, it was God himself. God had made a deal with the enemy and said, I will pay the price. What is it going to cost? It's going to cost blood. What is it going to cost? It's going to cost life. What is it going to cost? Uh, it's going to cost something greater. Now watch this. and I'm, I'm going to tie it up right here and make a quick altar call. You're, you're a rational person. You're a rational person. You're a rational human being. So let's be rational for a second. If you are going to exchange something and a God took himself and died for a mortal, who has gotten the better end of the deal? A God dies for a mortal. Well, pastor, what, why is that important? This is highly important. It is actually acclaimed critical. Watch this. It is critical because it shows value. Say value. Light up the chat. You are so valuable. Nobody is going to exchange. I need you to understand this. The whole sermon is based on this. If you were not valuable... How can I use something so expensive to buy something cheap? Can I say that differently? I don't know. I wanted to get this. If you get this, you're going to be all right. You walk into a watch store. You see a watch. You're buying this watch. You're paying... You could buy a watch for maybe 50 bucks, 100 bucks. I'm talking Canadian dollars. You could get a watch for $100. You could also get a watch for $100,000.
If I walked into a store, watch store, and gave a man $100,000 for a watch, it means that the thing that I am purchasing, the $100,000, the only reason why I'm giving $100,000 is because the thing that is being purchased is worth. I, <laughs> come on now. It's got to be worth it. It, it is not the thing itself. It's what I pay for it that makes the thing worth it. What tells you that you're valuable is what God paid for you. Amen. What God exchanged for you tells you how much you're valued. God could have used, God could have used anything. He could have used a goat. He could have used the same system he used from, he was from creation. But God wanted to do something. God wanted to understand how you to understand how much you are loved, how much you are valued. God is paying billions, 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 billions of dollars. That thing better be worth it. If you are paying a billion dollars for something, it better be worth it. If you're paying two billion dollars for something, it better be worth it. If you're paying a trillion dollars for something, it better be worth it. My friend, you are worth it. The great exchange that God died for you. My, my, you don't even understand how valuable you are. Which man, the Bible tells us this, I'm wrapping up before we go to altar call. The Bible tells me this. That a certain man, hallelujah, he purchased, he, he found, he went out and he found in a field a pearl of great price. He found in a field a pearl of great price. And the Bible said he doesn't buy the pearl. He, he sees that it is so valuable. He buys the entire field. He buys the entire field because he understands he sell, sold everything he had to buy the entire field because what was in the field was more important than what he paid for. Oh, Sheikh or Rabbi. Hallelujah. You don't know how valuable you are. That's why God did it. That's why God did it. I'm going to stop here, but that's why God did it. God did it because you see, there's no other way to prove to you that you are valuable. If God used goats, if he used sheep, if he used oxen like he used to do, man would just go, yeah, well, you know, I, God, you exchanged me for a goat. God, you exchanged me for a sheep. God, you exchanged me for a turtle dove. Okay, fine. But God says, I want to show you something. I want to tell you how valuable you are. And the proof is in the doing. It's not in the speaking. I'm going to prove it to you. So the next time you look at the great exchange, the next time you understand that the emancipator, the price paid for you was because you are worth it. God died for me. The great exchange. Uh, hallelujah. I heard the writer said, not all the blood of beasts uh, on Jewish altars slain uh, could give this guilty conscience peace uh, or wash away the stain. Somebody light up the chat with me, but Christ, the heavenly lamb, took all my sins away. A sacrifice of nobler name, a richer blood than they. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. 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 Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. If you are outside of God and Christ, the price paid for you was because you were worth it. The exchange that was made was because you were worth it. Hallelujah. Because God knew your value. You had purpose. You had intention. Hallelujah. Amen. You have dominion. You have value. Amen. You are worth every drop of Jesus' blood. You are worth everything. When I, I, I like to say it like this. When we think about revelation and the judgment day, most people think that it's because man, man is going to hell because he's a sinner. Man is not going to hell because he's a sinner. Man is going to hell because he rejected the exchange. He rejected it. He's going to hell because he rejected salvation. He rejected the price. And watch this. I'm, 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 I'm going to wrap it right here. Watch this. Jesus, God is the great judge. Jesus Christ is the lawyer. The prosecutor is Satan. You are on trial because we sinned. And there was a sentence to be made. 
And the judge says, death is the penalty. Death is the penalty. You got to die. You got to die with no possibility of returning. You got to go to the electric chair. You got to go to the gallus. It's the end of you. Hallelujah. But I heard, hallelujah, Jesus say, your strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. I heard the writer said, but Jesus paid it all. Come on, church. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but the great emancipator, he washed it whiter than snow. Somebody praise the Lord. Give him glory somewhere. Mighty God. Oh, I feel my Holy Ghost all over me. Man, you are worth it. I never, as I go to the altar call, I never, once I understood this, I stopped using the expression unworthy though I be. When I was a young man, I was taught to use that expression. Our worth is not in ourselves. Our worth is in God. It goes back to the purpose he made you. See, you didn't make yourself. I didn't make myself. He made us. He was the one who valued us. We are not unworthy. We are worthy because he made us. But we are not worthy by ourselves. We are worthy because of him. You are worth it. If you weren't worth it, he would not have paid it. And so if you are enslaved tonight, 901, it's time for me to end. If you are not a Christian tonight, just can you just, can you put up your hand? Can you raise your hand in the chat? Because if we're all Christians, there's no point in me praying for somebody. I'm making an altar call. I don't want to waste your time. It's probably easier for you to give you back some time for tomorrow. Could you just raise your hand in the chat if you're not a believer? Just raise your hand in the chat. Galaxy A21S. Thank you. I appreciate that. Just keep your hands raised. I want to pray for you. Anybody else? You're not a believer. Thank you for raising your hand and having the courage to do so. Just raise your hand in the chat. You're not a believer. And you've, you've, you're not a Christian right now. And you've just, you've, you, want to, you want to be prayed for. We have Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Galaxy S7, thank you. Thank you very much. I just, okay, we have three people that raised their hands. Um, if anybody else would like to raise before I pray and hand back to Missionary Henry, just raise your hand. This is, we're not, this is the real deal. This is not just, we're not keeping a crusade just to waste time. We want you to have value for your time. I want to pray with you. Would you bow your heads where you are? And I'm going to ask you, Sandra, Galaxy S7, Galaxy 821 S, just lift your faith to God. God is the God who's awesome. My father, the great I am, who dwells in the light that no man can approach. These crusades were designed to bring the word of light and truth. I don't know if I have done justice enough to you tonight, but whatever was in my heart, I spoke it. I believe it. I accept it. I want to thank you for those who thought it necessary, although we are not in brick and mortar, to be able to put together a program so people can come and hear the gospel. We have to try. And these three beloved individuals came tonight and raised their hands to be prayed for. The writer says, I know not how the spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith within. I do not understand it, Father. I really don't. All I know is that if a man opens up his heart to you, you will reveal yourself to him, to her. And so as I pray for these three individuals, 
God, I lay a virtual hand upon them. Church, agree with me. This is why we kept the crusade. It's not for your testimony. It's not to sing songs and to, and just to uh, read scriptures. It's not just to preach, to just say we had a crusade. These are the people we came to minister to. So I need your faith right now. I need you to lift up your faith. You may be giving attention to something else. I'm just going to ask you for another two or three minutes. Just give your full attention. Because when we all agree, God will do great things in the earth. So give, give your attention right now. God, I believe it doesn't take years or months or hours or even minutes. I believe the moment a person believes that you are the son of God and they confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, they begin the process towards salvation. Right there in that moment with all their mistakes, with all the things they need to solve, with all the problems that they still have to go contend with, perhaps in a situation where they cannot even make the full commitment at this point. I believe with all my heart, if they believe that you are the son of God, it begins. It begins. And from there, all they need to do is to continue so you can finish the work in them. Remember Sandra right now. You know her journey. You know where she's come from. You know the journey. You know the path. You know the things that have happened in her life. You know why she's on this line tonight. And I pray you will allow her to give her life to you. The person calling from Galaxy 7S. The person from Galaxy 21S. God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Even though their names do not appear on the screen, it matters not that I know them. What matters is that you know them. Hallelujah. And so, thou great emancipator. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Word made flesh, who gave your life because you thought Sandra was worth it. You saw, thought that the two other persons were worth it. And you said, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to give them a fighting chance, an opportunity to come to know me. And so I pray by your grace, Father, that this night they will surrender and decide with the, with the path unclear, with the way not clear, just decide that I'm going to start my journey towards God. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Thank you.